TV films of Task Force 58 under Vice Admiral Mark A. Mitcher as it proceeds through heavy seas on its way toward the Tokyo area. Objective is to tie down the Japanese Air Force so that it can't intercept the large force of transports, landing craft, and supply ships heading northward for landings on Iwo Jima. Approaching the target, weather conditions continue adverse. 16th February, pilots leave the briefing room on their way to the planes. Takeoffs are imperiled by the heavy seas. Fifteen hundred planes take part in the attack. Heavy storm clouds blanket the Tokyo area. Mount Fujiyama. One of our planes strafes a ship in the harbor. an enemy interceptor. <laughs> Japanese aircraft factories are struck heavily. <laughs> the attack continues for more than nine hours. Next day, it's followed up with another attack lasting more than eight hours. Throughout the attacks, the enemy offers only slight resistance. Our losses amount to nine fighter planes and four pilots. Four of Japan's largest and most important engine and assembly plants receive devastating blows during the two-day strike. Strafing planes caught on the airfields. About 2,000 are found on the ground. Altogether, 659 enemy planes are destroyed in the air and on the ground. is being wiped out at the northern end of EO, supplies pour into the southern beaches. By 13th March, our casualties total more than 18,000, including almost 4,000 dead. Enemy dead total nearly 20,000. Evacuating wounded men to a hospital ship. Mopping up operations continue to unearth Japanese hiding in the many caves dug in the cliffs and sides of volcanoes. Two Japs were killed in front of this cave trying to fight their way out. The remaining three are taken prisoner after hiding ten days. They appear weak from lack of water. After stripping and searching them, military police march them to the stockade for questioning. Many of the Japanese gun installations are in caves 30 to 40 feet deep. The small exposed part blends so well with the surroundings that they can't be discovered until they open fire. Even then, the heaviest bombs, including 12,000 pound AP, frequently have no effect. Many of the emplacements are so situated that they could not be hit from the sea or the air. Infantry had to wipe them out.
A B-29 makes an emergency landing. Returning from a mission, the bomber would have had to land in the ocean if EO hadn't been taken. Infantry and tank units of Company I, 503rd Paratroop Regiment, mop up on Corregidor. Jap sniper and machine gun pockets in the hills near Breakwater Point are destroyed by our troops moving against strong enemy resistance. Guns from American destroyers pour shells into the area to cover the paratroopers' advance. Machine gun fire reduces Jap positions. Troops of Company F, 503rd Paratroop Regiment, close in on a fortified artillery magazine. An 81mm mortar fires smoke shells on a Jap strong point to identify the target for bombing. Low-flying planes strafe the enemy. A blown-up powder magazine destroyed by the Japs to halt our advance. Companies A and B of the 1st Battalion on a patrol mission were trapped and wiped out in the explosion. A knocked out U.S. tank and a dead American soldier. Troops of the 3rd Battalion moving up to replace the 1st Battalion pass American ambulances wrecked in the explosion. Fire direction center of a parachute field artillery battalion controlling gunfire on the eastern part of Corregidor. A heavy artillery barrage prepares the way for the infantry advance. Patrols move along the beach at Rock Point, cleaning out enemy pockets in caves and cliffs. Japanese suicide boats found along the shoreline of Corregidor. Each boat had a one-man crew and carried a 300-pound charge of dynamite. Several of our ships were rammed and sunk by the boats. PT boats cross Manila Bay to Corregidor, bringing General Douglas MacArthur to the island for flag-raising ceremonies. General MacArthur is met at the dock by Colonel George M. Jones, commanding officer of the 503rd Regiment. Inspecting the large coastal defense guns at Wheeler Battery overlooking the entrance to Manila Bay. The general enters the west end of Malinta Tunnel. General MacArthur arrives at the site of the flag-raising ceremony near the ruins of the officers' quarters. During the ceremony, General MacArthur cited the 503rd Regimental Combat Team for brilliant action on Corregidor and presented Colonel Jones with a Distinguished Service Cross. The American flag is raised on Corregidor for the first time since 22nd March, 1942. In his speech, General MacArthur called the recapture of Corregidor one of the most brilliant exploits in all military history and enjoined the troops to hoist the colors and let no enemy ever haul them down. Chinese-owned and operated junks carrying supplies on the Yungning River, China. The junks are pulled upstream by teams of coolies. When the junks reach a point in the narrow river canyons where fast-flowing rapids make the job too strenuous for a single team, the boats are temporarily anchored, and the coolie teams combine efforts to pull a single boat at a time through the difficult stretch. The coolies chant a song similar to that of the Volga boatmen to help them pull in unison. Shortage of normal facilities forces our army to use every available means of Chinese transportation. These coolie carts are used to bring empty gasoline drums from the airfield to various alcohol factories. Alcohol is the main fuel for American convoys and has to be transported from the factories about 150 miles to our supply base. 
filled drums in the storehouse. The drums are reshipped by means of mule cart trains. Arriving at the American convoy station near our supply base, a GI and a Chinese contractor check the load. Filling the tank of a convoy truck. A convoy on the way to the alcohol factories waits to be ferried across the Luho River. Oars made of unshaped poles reveal the extremely primitive facilities in use. Reaching the other side of the river, observers report this to be the sort of transportation our armies will encounter as they penetrate the interior of China. Troops bivouacking in the hills bordering the Burma Road show originality in building temporary homes for themselves. These crude but comfortable shelters are known as boshes. Some boshes are simply tents made of canvas or parachute silk coverings. Others are more elaborately constructed, even to having indoor fireplaces with hollow bamboo smokestacks. The wooden frames of the shelters are made of timber chopped in the nearby woods. The boshes are usually covered with canvas mantas, which were originally used for wrapping pack mule cargo. A few are large enough to accommodate four men. A wash basin stand. Bamboo wood with which the area abounds is used for everything. The shower bath is also constructed of bamboo, which resists rotting from water or dampness. The bamboo makes excellent furniture. This bed, when covered with straw or other mattress material, will furnish comfortable sleeping accommodations. Tables and chairs are made from the resilient wood, which can be easily cut with machete or GI knife. Rope to tie the pieces together is obtained from parachutes. Since the troops are supplied mostly by air, plenty of chutes are available for building purposes. Shelters are constructed with any materials at hand. Roofs are even made of burlap feed bags and corrugated box sides. These boshes show that the soldiers have been able to make even the wild Burma jungle livable. The T-26 heavy tank. It is characterized by a sloping V-shaped front and a very low silhouette. Because of its similarity to some German tanks, Troops are cautioned to familiarize themselves thoroughly with the T-26's characteristic turret and body outlines. It crosses trenches as wide as eight feet. Climbs any grade up to 60%. The new tank uses an individually sprung torsion bar suspension. A center-guided all-metal track 24 inches wide is used on the T-26. Power is supplied by a V8 liquid cool type engine with a gross horsepower of 500 at 2600 RPM. The tank commander's cupola has a torsion spring which makes the door easy to open and close. So that the tank commander can look directly out when his door is closed, the cupola is equipped with six vision blocks as well as a revolving periscope. The E3 model mounts the 90 millimeter gun M3. Additional modifications will embody even more powerful weapons. The muzzle brake and especially a new hydro spring mechanism reduce recoil to a minimum. There's space for storing 60 rounds of ammunition. 10 ready rounds are on the turret walls. On the first army front, a newly arrived T-26 E-3 is inspected by General Hodges and his staff officers. Increasing numbers of these tanks are seeing extensive action in the Rhine offensives. North 
of Trier in the lower Moselle Valley. Units of General Patton's 3rd Army battle their way through the Eiffel Hills, straightening a line running 35 miles up to the fallen enemy base of Prim. Early in March, the 11th Armored Division, in conjunction with the 4th Infantry Division, pushes forward preparatory to a jump off from the Kill River above the Moselle to the Rhine. German positions in the hills above Trier are brought under fire. This offensive, which began late in February when armor and infantry crossed the Moselle and began clearing out the Moselle Tsar Triangle, is to result in the collapse of last enemy territory west of the Rhine. Nazi prisoners seek cover from the fires of German batteries. They were captured at Ost, Germany, northeast of Prim. This action is well beyond the Siegfried Line, which the Third Army has smashed at all points north of Trier. The drive to Cologne. On the approaches to Germany's fourth largest city, the enemy had prepared huge roadblocks to be rolled into position when first army troops struck from the northern and southern outskirts. On 5th March, men of the 3rd Armored Division eliminate pockets of resistance in the suburban towns of Pulheim and Bockelmund. A total of 15 villages around Cologne are taken in the advance on the city. The few remaining civilians seek the shelter of our lines as street fighting intensifies. Troops under Major General Maurice Rose quickly batter down the spotty opposition to their penetration of the Cologne city limits. Augmenting the two First Army units which had crossed the Ruhr at Duren, the Third Army spearheaded the drive due east, reaching the Rhine downstream from Cologne before turning south for this rush toward the city. The streets of Cologne are not far ahead. Tanks and infantry press forward on the road leading directly into the heart of the besieged metropolis. The cathedral spires gradually loom closer as the advancing column continues its uninterrupted approach. There is some machine gun fire and occasional shells, but little concerted resistance. At the underpass into the city, the Nazis have set up a barricade consisting of disabled streetcars and heavy iron beams. E and A companies of the 36th Armored Infantry Regiment are first to reach this roadblock and they rapidly remove its many components. A tank dozer is utilized to pull out the streetcars blocking the underpass. In 45 minutes, the barrier has been removed and armor rolls into the city proper. The Germans are holding out in various strong points and bomb-shattered buildings. Most of the opposition comes from regular troops. Our units report no house-to-house -house resistance by the Volkssturm. The enemy is pursued from street to street. Those attempting to flee in motor cars are repeatedly fired upon.
snipers are routed from their positions. tank suffers a direct hit and the crew leaps from the flames. Concussion rocks the handheld camera with its telephoto lens. Nearby the shell of the cathedral is still standing almost intact except for holes in the roof. The edifice received no direct bomb hits in approximately 25 all-out raids on Cologne. Inside, the 700-year-old cathedral is bare, its religious relics having been removed to places of safety. Fifteen miles south of Cologne, the First Army captures Bonn. The enemy barely had time to blow up the span across the Rhine. Two Nazi engineers were trapped on the bridge after placing the charge. Even as the First Division takes Bonn, the 9th Division, which has been fighting at its side through two years of far-flung campaigning, smashes into Bad Godesberg. This city, 12 miles south of Bonn, is captured on the morning of 8th March. The normal population was 23,000. In 1938 at Godesberg, Hitler and Neville Chamberlain met in this building prior to the Munich Conference at which the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia was formally ratified. Establishing the Remagen Bridgehead, vehicles in long line move up to the span named after General Ludendorff. Nazi plans called for demolition of this bridge between Remagen on the west bank and Erpel on the east. But on 7th March, 9th Armored Division patrols removed the charges before serious damage could be done and we had a bridge intact over the Rhine. Tanks and infantry crossed to capture Erpel and surrounding high ground before pushing on inland. The bridge's railroad tracks have been planked over for vehicular traffic. Our ACAC opposes persistent enemy attempts to dive bomb the Ludendorff Bridge. <laughs> the bridgehead rapidly expands. This marks the first breaching of the Rhine River line since Napoleon crossed in 1805. Fifty miles north of the Remagen bridgehead, air and ground assaults mark the 9th Army's drive to the Rhine opposite Dusseldorf. tank of the 2nd Armored Division opens fire. <laughs> Lieutenant General Simpson's troops drive closer to the remainder of Field Marshal Montgomery's 21st Army Group, the British 2nd Army and the Canadian 1st. Striking from the Noyce area where three bridges have been blown, the 9th Army gains control of the 13 miles of the Rhine's west bank. firing on enemy barges in the Rhine before Dusseldorf. In the meantime, the 35th Infantry Division, after taking the town of Geltern, Germany, moves forward to make contact with British units advancing down from the north. Men of the 35th meet Tommies of a Welsh Division. Bicycles are used by elements of the 84th Infantry Division along roads opposite Duisburg. The two-wheelers are abandoned as they strike out across somewhat rugged Rhineland terrain. A combined Anglo-American drive further north is reducing the enemy's west bank bridgehead opposite Wesel, paving the way for new Rhine crossings north of the Ruhr. Tanks participate in the routing of last enemy forces fleeing to the east bank.
The battle for the town of Gay Nant, due west of Duisburg. Less than three weeks after this action, the 21st Army Group is across the Northern Rhine.